Welcome back to Moscone West, everybody. I'm Dave Vellante, and you're watching the continuous coverage of theCUBE's focus on RSAC 2024. I'm here with my co-host, Shelly Kramer, with theCUBE Research. Michael Fay is here. He's the co-founder and CEO of Island, a company just raised $175 million on a $3 billion valuation. Michael, good to see you. Thanks for coming on theCUBE. Thanks for having me. You bet. Let me set this up, because this is a really interesting summary that you guys you know, shared with us. You, using consumer technology on your endpoints demands an inordinate amount of retrofitting and supporting infrastructure to make it work for the enterprise, which is very expensive. A lot of leaders have discovered the one thing that changes everything, and, and you're going to talk about this. You've got a point of view, and you're going to explain what you call the massive tax that typical enterprises unnecessarily pay, what can be done to get out from underneath it, what companies stand to gain from modern workspace built specifically for work. So we're going to talk about that. For the first question is, I presume this is why you started mm -hmm. Island. Why did you start Island? You know, I started Island, it was funny, I was debating on retiring. I was actually, you know, in that mode. Such a young man. I, I know, I know. And, and, what, and the reason was, I've been in cybersecurity my whole career, and the idea of reinventing yet another mousetrap, you know, just doing what I did in the past a little bit better, trying to displace that, I just lost interest in that. When my co-founder brought this idea forward of what if we upgraded the browser from consumer technology to enterprise technology, then my mind raced about all the impact it could have, beyond cybersecurity even, you know, to end users, to the business, and it quickly became an idea I had to see to fruition. And then I realized I could leverage this massive network of brilliant people to bring to deliver this. And so I was able to hire all these great people I've worked with for 20, 30 years, and, so it really became a, a, a wonderful endeavor as it kind of played out mentally. So by the way, congratulations on the raise. Thank you. you. Know, this is, this, that's, now you got some, some good capital. What was that like doing the raise? Did you have to come in and change everything to AI and say we're <laughs> AI security? Or, yeah, was, you know, we, we might be the only up round without an AI <laughs> attached to us. Um, you know, we were very fortunate. We had a, a lot of offers come to us and what drove that was we've hit this really accelerant of market traction and that, the investors started to see that. Um, we weren't going to raise right now, but when it became double our last round, uh, it seemed like, you know, let's do it. I do think we're really good stewards of capital. We have over 350 million in cash in the bank at this point. We've only taken on 480. So we built the category, built the whole product, you know, hundreds of customers, millions of browsers deployed, owned the category, set it up all for under you know, 150 million, which in, in our space is, is a light spend. So you feel like you got product market fit. So Very now what, clear. you're scaling go to market? Now right. it scales go to market, but also R&D. What's happened as we've gotten these customers on board, they keep expanding what our vision can be and they're bringing us amazing features that add more ROI back to them. And so we want to embrace all of those. Mm -hmm. And so we want to have an R&D team large enough that we could keep saying, bring it to me. Right now our average delivery period is 14 days for a feature for a customer. We want to keep it at that. Because in our industry, it's usually months. Right. And our customers feel that. And so they keep bringing us more great ideas because they see them materialize in the product. It's some of the best stuff we've got going on. And I want to get into how you're able to do that, but to explain this kitchen table analogy <laughs> to our audience. Yeah, so the idea of using a, a consumer browser and what it means, I always try to just kind of bring it to something base. If we went into any of these boardrooms of these great companies that we're, we see around us today, we wouldn't find a kitchen table. Yet if there was any, anything we could steal from consumers, it would be sitting. You would think it's sitting at a table, we could do that. You can't go to your average furniture store and find a boardroom table. You buy those at a special place. And it's just because there's a couple holes cut out with you know, wires run through it. Yet we took a consumer browser that looks and feels the same way for the last two decades and is now our major operating system for business. And we've done nothing to appreciate the needs of the business. Then when that became a common open source project, so that we could literally use the same rendering engines, use the same networking engines, but rethink it for the enterprise, that's what opened it up. So instead of trying to make that kitchen table work in the boardroom, we said we understand what this is, what if we build something for the enterprise, but obviously it's going to look, it's going to feel, it's going to be what we understand, but it's going to speak to the needs of that group. And that really drove the business. That's interesting because yeah. you know, innovations always seem to start with consumer. Yeah. Right? But, but if you didn't try to apply that consumer, this is the premise, I think, you just try to apply that consumer uh, uh, technology to the enterprise, it, it doesn't work, yeah. especially in security. Well, and for us, think about it from the end user perspective. An average browser is built for five billion consumers. 
lowest common denominator across five billion users. Then you go into a knowledge worker and you give them that same tool. It'd be like all of us using Notepad to write all of our documents, right? Just the lowest common denominator application. We never industrialized, we never took the next step on the browser, and that was the opportunity we saw. And the manifestation is a wild ROI in cybersecurity and improvement and posture, but the business gets a bunch of benefits. And the thing I'm most proud of is end users like it. We put a ton of features in there to make end users more productive. Yeah. And that's key, it's one of the first cybersecurity tools that end users love, opposed to being forced or tolerated. Well you've got to have that, because you can roll out the sexiest tools on the planet, yep. and if all that happens internally is people grumble, and it's just <laughs> something else, and it's yeah. complicated, and so what I like here is I love the fact that security is foundational, and yes. I mean that just is like, I, I preach that gospel, it mm -hmm. feels like 24 seven, so, it, it, so we're on the same page there, security by design, um, but then that a familiar experience, so I don't have to go to some stupid site or a browser that I'm not familiar with and try to figure it out, nobody has time. So I love that, just yeah. speed of adoption and then, and then the tools built in that speak to increased productivity, functionality. I mean, okay, I'm yeah. in. Yeah, imagine right now if you're, if you're at home browsing for consumer need and it can't fill out your address or your credit card. You'd switch browsers, oh, this isn't a good one. Think of that poor call center worker that does the same thing all day long yeah. and nothing is there to help them. Yeah. So what we do is we give them 50 copy paste buffers, we integrate into their VoIP system, we auto-populate those buffers with everything they know about the person they're talking to, and then watch where they copy and paste from, and then automate that down the way. So we make their lives better, and we get them off all of this backhaul. Yeah. You know, a call center worker will often, you know, they'll be on a device, the device won't be trusted by the company that hires them, so they put them on Citrix, that backhauls to a Citrix server, then it backhauls to a web filter, then it gets spliced for DLP, then it goes to a peering network, mm. and that's if it's a light security footprint. And the end user clicks and all that has to happen. Then we show up and all that disappears, and they get a browser that feels like the one they've always known, and it works faster, it's simpler, and it starts to help them do their job. Meanwhile, the security team has infinite compliance and last mile control to raise that posture. So that weird scenario of better end user experience, save a lot of money, and better security posture, hasn't been something in our industry we've been able to offer very often. So do you have any um, customer examples? I mean, you talk about, we can save you money. Sure. So, do you have some examples you can yeah, share with I've us? Yeah, I've got uh, one customer that's going to shut down hundreds of racks out of their data center. Okay. Literally, all that stuff I just talked about manifests in hundreds of millions of dollars of expense. I have another customer that was given a budget cut and the whole entire budget cut, which they were planning on possible layoffs to their security org, was delivered just by island, just by reducing the amount of complexity in the organization. If you think about it, in that VDI setup, we're going to be a factor of probably one to 20 in cost. So it's 20 times more expensive to go with a VDI layered, you know, backhauling approach right. than just enabling it in the browser. But more importantly, it's still better security. Because mm -hmm. we don't get caught up in encryption, we don't get caught up in how the network works, we literally can manifest the entire set of controls that everything else is an unwelcome visitor in. It's breaking encryption, it's seeing stuff it's not supposed to, it's trying to do what the hackers are doing, but for the good guys. In this case, because we're originating the traffic, we have a set of controls that are really hard to manifest elsewhere. Okay. So you, you basically collapsed that, whole, collapsed that whole sequence of events that you just talked about, so that's the cost savings. What do I have to do as a customer to take advantage of this? What am I installing, what am I buying? Yeah, that's a great question. So we show up in a couple different ways. Mm -hmm. We can show up as an extension. We can show up as one of many browsers. We can show up as a portal or the primary browser. And it really is crawl, walk, run. What works for that customer? So we'll sometimes show up with just working for one application. You know, we have a uh, incredibly large um, hotel chain. We realized all their customer data sat inside of Salesforce. They had a couple thousand rules to protect that data when it got out. Mm -hmm. All that was gone by just saying, when that app comes up, it'll come up an island. The end user doesn't know it's island, it's just a window, and they have full control over that. So we can be in that kind of 
unknown face where you don't even realize it's an alternate browser, or we can literally manifest as a portal you go into. How do you make that transparent, or I guess opaque, to the, to the user? Sure. Because there's so many, you know, several different browsers out there. Yeah. And there's a little new browser war going on, so mm -hmm. how do you make that sort of disappear? So in that simple case, we just integrate to the IDP system, okay. and literally when they try to log in or try to go to that site, just like trying to go to Zoom, if you don't have the app, it'll say, would you like to download the app? If you have it, it'll just launch. Right. And so in our enterprise customers, it just launches. They don't have to figure this out. And then we operate as a portal. We literally work with the uh, company and put all the apps the customer's going to need. And whether it's web app or a fat app on the device, we'll call it so the end user doesn't have to figure out where do I go, which browser do I use, which thing, we'll, we'll manage all of that for them. And most of our implementations are very quick. Your perfect concepts are set up in under an hour. Most of our implementations are under a week. It's and a that, quick process. And sense. that control plane runs in the cloud somewhere? Or? So the beautiful part is the browser runs on your desktop. Right, of course. The policy downs lo downloads local. So our management console's in the cloud, but you really don't have to connect to it in any timely fashion. It's asynchronous. So when the last policy loads, that's what will run until you get a new one. So you don't have to worry about being on a plane, being behind the great firewall, we're still going to run just fine. It's a really novel idea. <laughs> How did you come up with this? <laughs> so we had been building web filtering and you know, all sorts of different ways to protect the web. And my partner founded a company that did a remote browser isolation. So a browser in the sky. And the reality is the cost and end user experience of that is less than ideal. Right. But in doing that, he had to build unique browsers. And then he realized that open source project had come so far that we could literally do that on the desktop. And then the idea just kept rolling. And we met with, the, before we wrote a line of code, we met with over 100 CIOs and CISOs at some of the biggest names out there. And they just validated all sorts of use cases for us. So we picked the top 10 use cases, made that our MVP, stayed in stealth two years, knowing that end user experience had to be perfect. You know, most cybersecurity companies stayed in stealth for about two minutes. Uh, we were two years. <laughs> and then when we came out, we had a fully baked product that could deliver on those 10 use cases, and we've just been adding use cases ever since. And what's the licensing model? How, how do I pay for it? Per user. So it's just a per user cost. We have different modules, uh, so that you know, somebody that's getting massive ROI from the, from the uh, solution doesn't have to pay the same amount as somebody getting less. Um, but you put on as many devices as you want per user. And that's become a big use case for us. You'll be using it at work, but they'll give you licenses for my for phone your home and my devices. iPad, okay. So if there's a breach in your office, you just switch over to be BYOD YouTube. You get in, and you can roll with that. So, mm, yeah, that's so okay, cool. so I'm paying an, an annual service? Annual user fee, yep. Uh, okay, and so that's beautiful. So the business model is obviously very attractive. Now you mentioned as well that your customers are asking you to add new features. You're able yes. to add new features uh, very quickly. Can you explain that? Because that's part of your TAM expansion strategy. Take us through that. So what will often happen is they'll buy for one use case, mm -hmm. contractors, right? And then they'll come to us and say, you know, I could get rid of this other tool if you just did this. I'll give you an example, watermarking. In the financial world, they have to watermark their screen, so if somebody pulls a camera phone out, there's that watermark. Yeah. They were paying for a whole separate tool to do that when the browser could just do it. Not hard for us to do, we just didn't know you needed that. Healthcare has hundreds of these little quirks and features where there's another tool, another mm -hmm. set of code, another maintenance problem. And so it's just that kind of expansion that we get. So now we've got, you know, all sorts of different features in the product, but we have full modules around DLP, around network management, around AI. Um, we have a password manager. You know, it's, it's about 10 different modules now that we can add on. All of those reduce the total spend of the customer and give a more seamless integration. Because you're consolidating the existing number of tools. Is that the, typically we were just talking at our, <laughs> um, our kickoff, you hear, all, you hear a lot of talk about consolidation. The survey data that we have says, Half the customers are adding vendors, you know, yeah. and adding tools. And so, is it typical that your customers are, are collapsing the stack? Almost every deal we do is self-funded by literally displacing technology. But it's always different. Yeah. And, and the way we approach it is, if that web filtering solution you have is doing a great job for you, great. We'll embed the agent so you can call it from a BYOD device. If it's not, we'll get removed the need for it. If that CASB is governing your environment really well, great, we'll integrate to it, we'll send it messages so it can do its job better. So we try to stay collaborative with the whole space, but there are definitely, it's not, there are definitely products that aren't necessary when you have last mile control. Mm -hmm. It's not that I'm doing their function, like in the case of that um, Salesforce data control plane, 
I'm not doing the DLP checks that they were doing, I'm removing the need for it altogether. Right. And so when that evolution occurs, that's real displacement. That's real cost savings, because not only does the license go away, the admins, the, you know, the reports, the false positives, all of that disappears. You mentioned an agent, so that's your agent. Is, it, is so that correct? So it's our is browser, it, okay. but we can install the agents of other companies into it. Yeah. So we can be one package to deliver a full solution for whatever that organization. So it's kind of bring, bring your own agent. If they want, yeah. Right. Uh, what, what are you seeing, because you got it sounds like you got a, how many customers did you say you had? You a couple hundred now. Several hundred, so I'm sure it's you know, different sizes of companies. What are you seeing in terms of the average number of tools that are installed, oh security tools, at companies? You know, some of the data that we have su suggests that it could be as high as 50 to 75 on I, average. I think that's almost low. You think it's low? Yeah, yeah. I, now obviously the smaller organizations don't have the money or time to, to be that way, but when we get up to the larger ones, mm -hmm. I mean, just in a proof of concept, we'll hear seven, 10, 20 vendors being removed. Yeah. And they're not vendors I know. Mm. You know, it, it, it's amazing how much tech has had to be bolted on to these solutions just to get to a fully compliant environment. So, I have a question, uh, you know, this is really cool, mm -hmm. but I, I've spent 20 some years as a brand strategist and so what I look at are, you know, what are the challenges here? Because sure. it's cool, but it's different. Mm -hmm. You know what, you're not selling endpoint management, you're, you're right. not selling CASB, you're not, you're selling something that's completely different and you have to, you have to get your prospects to think differently yes. about how we solve for this. Yes. So my question to you is, with this new round of funding, are you allocating a bunch of it to marketing and messaging? And because training people on new things is not an easy thing. You're not wrong. You know, um, one of the first things you do when you found a company is the founder in you wants to create a category. Yeah. But if you're remotely intelligent, you don't want to do that, <laughs> right? It's very expensive, it's yeah. very hard. Unfortunately, we saw early on, we're going to have yeah. to create a category, we're going to have to do this. Um, what's benefited us, though, is when we get to the C-suite, 80% of the time when we demo to a C-suite, we get a deal. Okay. So for us, our marketing strategy is very clear. Get to those people that can enact change, yeah. that can look across their entire organization, focus on them, so we do spend on market being very targeted at that yeah. level because of the success rate yeah. of it. It's really hard for a C-suite to see, I get better at user experience, save money and improve cybersecurity, I got to manage this change. Well, and if you're the person who says, yeah, I'm not interested, you're kind of the dummy. Yeah. <laughs> and so it, you kind of have to make time to listen to this pitch and maybe think about it. It helps, and, yeah. and right now, if you look across, there are 13 major verticals we track. We, in the, in the 13 major verticals, we have at least two of the top 10 in every major vertical as a customer. So that helps. Then we went down market, and we've got customers of 500 users in the same verticals, and we have many of those in the same items. So now we can at least say, here's what is happening in a bank like you. Yeah. Here's what's happening in a healthcare organization like you. That helps immensely, because even early on, some of the people said, oh, I love this, but I'm not sure I'm going to be first. Now yeah. they know they're not first. We have 800,000 user deployments. You know, yeah. They don't have to worry about scale. So, We've, we've removed the fear factor some, but change is hard. Yeah. And that's the number one thing we're up against. Yeah. Not, not a competitor, not against tech, yeah. it's change. Yeah. So you're very well capitalized. Yes. You're building out go-to-market, scaling mm -hmm. th that. You're bringing in sort of engineering. Who, what, what's the profile of folks you're hiring these days? So, uh, very high-end engineers, um, as fast as we can find them, but the bar is very high. Mm -hmm. I would say probably one out of 50, one out of 100 engineers we actually interview are even at the level that, that our team's comfortable with. Uh, on the go-to-market side, we really want people that have worked with accounts for a long time. So if you look inside of our existing install base, if they were to fully deploy it across the entire, it's a massive IPO waiting to happen. So another way to say it is, our success is based on the happiness of our customers. So we're hiring go-to-market, we're looking for people that have been dedicated to success at their customers which is a little different. Most startups are looking for run and gun. You know, I want somebody to give me 30 customers in a hurry. I don't have that problem. I want to make sure that the customers I have are wildly successful. I'll get more. But if these set of customers aren't wildly successful, that will be our problem. So we're really focused on staffing that success group and the people that are used to doing that. So it's a different profile. I mean, my, like my go-to-market team, average age is 40 years old that is not a typical startup. Retention yeah. is really what you're most concerned about. Yeah. Exactly, and, yeah. and on the retention side, you know, at the customer, but one of my proudest metrics of the whole company is we've had less than a handful of people voluntarily leave in over the four years of the company. 
people that have joined, buy into the mission, they're delivering on it, there's no brain drain, that is incredibly helpful. Yeah. Normally at this point, four years, you've already cycled through a couple sales leaders, a couple yeah. product leaders, you know, you're trying to find the right people. We haven't had to do that. What are you Are doing you at the show? What are you showing? What's the, what's the action look like? So we have got a large uh, booth on the floor and uh, we're running demos constantly. Uh, also, we've got multiple suites across the city meeting with executives. I think we got six or seven of them out here. They'll be running full time and I'll be uh, it, you know, meeting with as many people as possible over here. Fantastic, well congratulations on the success. Thank you. Appreciate you coming on theCUBE and love to have you back and, and track that progress. Great, thank you. All right, you're very welcome. Okay, keep it right there. We're live from Moscone West, Dave Vellante with Shelly Kramer. Dave Linthicum is also in the house. You're watching theCUBE, we'll be right back.